but for me and to this moment uh, DMT is just the most amazing thing in the universe I mean it shouldn't exist it, it's impossible and every time I do it I come down I say this is impossible I mean to call that a drug what a joke I mean it just masquerades as a drug it's not a drug that's preposterous uh, the problem with DMT is its incredible power that only the most intrepid can form any coherent impression whatsoever of what's going on if it's a strong trip. I mean, there are sub-threshold trips where you just graze the tummy of the beast and then people come down with various models of archetypal closure with the cosmic carnival. That's the archetype of DMT, is the cosmic circus. And, and, but once you, if you actually get a strong hit of it, which is in no way dangerous, but simply a true boundary dissolving hit, it's into some place, it's almost like, well, I once said, you know, the, there's danger of death by astonishment. <laughs> and, and I think that's true. That's the major danger is death by astonishment. Because you just get in there and you say, my God, you know, I thought I had some expectation of what was possible. And instead, this is just so blown out. And it, re- it somewhat freaks me out, I have to confess. It's, it is so alien, so huge, so complete in itself, so unrelated to our petty concerns on this planet. I mean, I went to it first as an art historian, and, the, and I was a Jungian. I mean, I, you know, I had Jungian proclivities. And, and I thought, you know, w- what does this say about the archetypes? There is no archetype for this. Not in the painting of the Bushman, not in the ecstasies of Hildegard von Bingen, not in the ravings of Mandayan ecstatics. Human spiritual experience never got this deep, never tore open this doorway. And yet what? It's a long toke away for an ordinary human being? How could something that (laughs) titanic and beautiful and cosmic and alien be kept secret when what we do is we seek in all corners, in all times and places, for the bizarre, the outre, the unthinkable. We're always turning over rocks, secret teachings, you know, ancient cities, buried ruins, lost tribes, you name it. <laughs> well then, here is this thing which is like the absolute quintessence of what all those things are, are aiming for. You know, more stunning than the rise of Atlantis from the Atlantic seaboard is a toke of DM. MT, more appalling than the, arise, the arrival of alien star fleets in the skies of our planet. And yet, it's here. It's here. And I don't often invoke it. I mean, for me to talk about it is to invoke it, because it's weird to talk about it, because it reminds me that we don't know what we're doing at all, that we sit in rooms discussing all this stuff and, and you know, a war rages, ignorant armies clash by night, that whole thing. But, you know, this extraordinarily powerful thing, the depth of which, the measure of which is so hard to take, lies very near. What I had hoped from, what I had hoped for from ayahuasca was... Uh, my brother and I, when we got into this DMT stuff, we said, we've got to slow down this movie. I mean, you get in there for about 70 seconds, the first 35 of which is taken up with you checking all your meters to make sure you're not dead. <laughs> because that's that's what you assume, you know. You, ass- you say, I did it, I'm dead, I'm fuck it, I'm dead. <laughs> and And then you say, but, you know, 
chest rising and falling, <laughs> thoughts continuing in linear per- Apparently, I'm not dead. <laughs> Apparently, I'm something else. Well, then by the time you sort it out, you're usually coming down. And people come down babbling, raving. I mean, I've seen you know people who've headed mega corporations, people who are accustomed to uh, ordering hundreds of people around, just completely... Uh, come apart because it is so unexpected. So our notion was slow the movie down, get in there. And uh, uh, ayahuasca looks like a strategy for doing that. And we couldn't imagine, you know, can you picture people wearing penis sheaths and painting themselves with red ochre and they have this and this is what they're doing? And and then it makes the whole notion of history seem crazy. I mean, I mean we're primitives because we diddle around with atom smashers and stealth bombers and stuff like that. I mean, you know, and these people have this other thing. So, of course, they don't wear clothes. Build <laughs> would you? You know? And uh, largely, I would say, uh, what we've learned from 20, 25 years of dealing with this is that our strategy was right. Ayahuasca will let you in to these places, and so will psilocybin. What I've decided, based on experience, is that uh, what I'm interested in is a very tiny subset of all the smorgasbord of possible altered states and experiences that life and nature offer up, that there are many altered states, detura, ketamine, MDMA, uh, endlessly, and then, you know, uh, states brought on by ordeal and, uh, and fasting and meditation. I, I am only interested as a phenomenologist, definitely more with the attitude of the scientist than some kind of conclusion drawer. I'm interested in this very circumscribed area in organic nature because it's not supposed to be there, folks. It's like a a little... a a doorway into the previous universe or something. The whole, you know, in the... at the height of Islam in the 10th century, the poets of the Mughal dynasty said of the city of Isfahan in, in Iran because of its mosques and architecture, that it was half the world. The Isfahan is half the world. DMT is half the world. The shiny, bright, active, uh, exfoliating and bizarre part. Well then, we then are poised in this strange dimension of diminished possibility. Where are we? What is that? What is it to possess a body such that you can use it as an instrument to turn on and off these places. How does it reflect on the quest for understanding of the here and now? How does it uh, reflect on the quest for, uh, I don't know, immortality or or enlightenment or uh, a sense of fitting in to the cosmic purpose? I don't know. I mean, one can play a reductionist game and say that the human brain-mind system is an alarm clock, DMT is a hammer, hit the alarm clock with the hammer and you learn all about gears (laughs) because they spring out and become visible. But uh, And this is how science works. This is the scientific method. Smash it. Then count the pieces. Find the bigger pieces. Find the littlest pieces. Smash them. Count the pieces. Find the little pieces. Smash them. That's how it proceeds. Well, obviously, that's not going to take us too far in this domain because it's entirely made up of structure, of connection, of relationship, of uh, thought. And... uh, Because I'm concerned about the planet and the predicament we're in and the way we spend our resources and cheat our children of a sane future and all that, I keep trying to reconnect this back into the human world. But I frankly don't know whether that can be done. 
Another area I work in is I try to connect it up to the perennial philosophies of, of humanity, Zen and Buddhism and shaman. I don't know whether that can be done. The shamans that I have gotten really close to have not been... I would not call... They were able to cure people, but they had no pretension of spiritual accomplishment. They weren't even interested in that. They were interested in what they would call understanding. The same thing which drives a scientist. They say... I I mean, Don Fidel, who I took most of my ayahuasca with, we would take it on Saturday nights with a group of about 40 people and cure... And then we would take it on Wednesday nights, just he and I or a couple of other people. And that was for learning, he always said. And he said, you can't cure unless you learn. And I felt very comfortable with these people because it, it from the outside, it looks like ritual and taboo and power. And from the inside, it's just, hey, let's all cook something up and try to figure it out. It was totally familiar to me from my days in Berkeley in the 60s. It's the head ethic. It's cook it up, try it out, try and make sense of it with your friends. And uh, if we... You see, I think it's very disempowering to believe that somebody else has the answer and that your life consists of sorting out a bunch of options to try and find this person who has the answer. Uh, The generous point of view, the ecumenical point of view, when looking at the world's religions and spiritual traditions, is to say everybody has a piece of the answer. You know, the Buddhists have a piece, the Kabbalists have a piece, everybody has a piece. The mushroom on this subject is extremely ungenerous. It says, nobody has a peace. It's just preposterous. You know, the reason the world doesn't make sense to you is because the world doesn't make sense to you. How could it? I mean, look where you're starting from. Where is it writ in adamantine that troops of monkeys should comprehend the architectonics of the cosmos? You know, it's just uh, not part of the deal. So uh, then you have to rest with some kind of provisional arrangement. But I, I somehow think that the forced evolution of language is how we're going to work our way back into taking care of our planet and that psychedelics are the catalyst for this. They show us, number one, that there is a transcendent other which I certainly didn't believe there was till I took psychedelics. I mean, I was raised Roman Catholic. I spent a lot of time deconditioning myself from the transcendent other and embracing a kind of, uh, of materialist agnosticism. Well, that lasted 15 seconds into the first DMT trip, and then that had been vaporized <laughs> for all time. So I, I think we need to honor the religious impulse, but I'm very, I'm very skeptical of all hierarchical con games where the idea is somebody knows something and somebody else doesn't, and then they have to trade off their uh, relationship. You know, the Rolling Stones have a song that says, you don't get what you want, you get what you need. Uh, I don't think you're going to spend very long involved with these things at a deep level without scaring your socks off uh, eventually. I mean, one of the great things about these psychedelic teachers is that they are so gentle with beginners. And then the flip side of that coin is they are so unforgiving with veterans. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I have hard trips often. And the way I explain it to myself is, you know, I pretty much accept Rupert Sheldrake's notion of the morphogenetic field and uh, uh, feel like the psychedelics amplify the morphogenetic field of the totality. And, you know, why shouldn't I have difficult trips? The totality is in such a weird state of turmoil. 
I mean, you couldn't pay me to take five grams of mushrooms in the present circumstances simply because I can feel the riptides in the historical dimension just churning everything into white water. I mean, I'd stay out of the water till uh, it dies down a little. Uh, fear is a problem because, well, there are different reasons, but here's a, a reductionist reason. These compounds are CNS stimulants, and that means they're going to stimulate what's called the fight-or-flight reflex in the hind brain. One of the hardest things I think you, you have to learn to do is to discipline the hind brain. You know, to sit in a full lotus position, absolutely petrified with fear, and not do anything about it, except breathe and sing. You know, um, Paul Herb, uh, Paul Herbert, <laughs> the other Herbert, the Herbert who wrote Dune who is such a minor figure that I can't even remember his first name, Frank Herbert, he uh, has a wonderful thing in there talking about fear. And he says, fear comes like a wind out of the desert and it blows through you. And all you can do is let it blow itself out. And you really can do this. You just wait. Fear is a kind of state of... Uh, agitation of the organism that chemically cannot maintain itself very long. So wait it through. Then in terms of practical suggestions, sing. You must sing. I mean, it's terrible to be have it sit heavily on you and to try and deal with it like this, you know, just crumple. You have to oxygenate your body. You have to begin moving energy through your body. You can sing your way out of most situations. That's the best advice. And you can breathe your way out of, of most situations. And uh, it's a set of techniques. No, you're quite right. It's a set of techniques. They're very simple, but if you don't know them, you're in deep, deep water. And breath control and not being afraid to articulate. We have some kind of taboo against sounding. But, you know, I've sung, I've started in the depths of hell singing to save my soul and managed to sing my way right through normality and right on into heaven, you know. It takes courage. And courage is not something that is demanded of us very much in the modern world. I mean, we occasionally deal with large amounts of fear, like when some jackass cuts in front of you in, on the freeway and, you know, you soak your clothes with sweat in under a third of a second, those kinds of things. But courage, where we actually determine to do something that feels dangerous or challenging to us, and then doing it, we don't do. And especially boundary-dissolving challenges... I mean, the macho type will, you know, climb El Capitan, jump out of airplanes, uh, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But strangely enough, those macho types are sometimes the most reluctant to just sit quietly in their living room on five dried grams because uh, it's a different kind of surrender. You know, it's a it's a surrender to something feminine and penetrating, and uh, you don't have to. It's the opposite reflex. Surrender is the opposite reflex to conquest. Did you want to say something? No. Yeah. Could you contrast uh, this experience uh, with experience like the trance dance or the bushman or kundalini type of experiences? Well, it's very hard to get inside somebody else's experience, especially when it's culture-bound. For purposes of operational efficiency, I just have long ago decided nothing works but drugs. <laughs> and, and it causes a lot of friction. I mean, that's the hard way of putting it. It's really nothing works but plants. But... Uh, I put in a lot of time trying, to, you know, breath control and pranayama and all these things and reading the literature. 
And I just, I'm just not convinced that they're getting it. The literature doesn't reflect it. The, the mystical literature in all times and places tends toward unitary um, effulgence or something, the white light. In other words, everything is supposed to be, all contradictions are dissolved, everything becomes love and light and the hierophany. This is the archetypal hierophany. Uh, I don't, this is not what they're talking about in the Amazon. They enter into a world of jeweled multiplicity. There is no effort to push it towards some kind of Neoplatonic uh, end state. It's that what is revealed is a dimension of incredible complexity. And some people have said of me, to me, uh, that I'm lost in samsara. I can accept that. That sounds right. Uh, I love multiplicity. I mean, I'm, I love nature, which to me means multiplicity. I'm an insect collector, for God's sake, an art historian, a, a heresy hunter. It's for me all in the details. That's what I love, the richness, the texture of it. And uh, I... It's a troubling question for people because people want to be told that there's another way to get to it. And there may be, but it's unbelievably difficult, unbelievably uncertain, and uh, uh, very hard to recognize. Schizophrenia, it doesn't convince me entirely that that's the same thing. Many schizophrenics are obviously very, very unhappy people. And uh, you see, I just don't feel the force of this argument that you should be able to do it on your own. Why should you be able to do it on your own? How about that you can't do it unless you humble yourself to cut a deal with a plant? That seems more logical to me, you know, that it begins with an act of humility instead of an act of, you know, no women, no dope, no this, I'm going to seal myself into the alchemical vessel. Yeah. Are, are you, is that statement reflecting a, a, a position that there's a potentiation in the pharmacokinetics? I mean, are you, are you or is this really based upon the activity of chemicals and the interaction of chemicals in the brain. And then to go along with that, in your in your own pushing to try to understand this, how do you value the philosophical versus the actual, again, that model of, well, can we talk about any cerebral cortical uptake or uh, biochemistry again? How do you value those two? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure. I. I'm not sure. I understand your question. I mean, I'm very interested in the nuts and bolts details of how this happens. And my brother is a, a pharmaceutical chemist, drug designer. So we work in the in, on the nuts and bolts issue. Uh, I want to know where these visions are coming from. I would like a complete understanding of the psychedelic experience. I would like to turn the light of the psychedelic experience upon the psychedelic experience and, and try to understand uh, what's happening. The best theory so far, I think my brother and I put together in a book we wrote called The Invisible Landscape, uh, there are certain clues Obviously, uh, memories persist in human beings throughout a lifetime. But we know that no physical part of the organism persists through a lifetime except the neural DNA. That means that we either have to hypothesize that memories are copied perfectly and handed along in some system uh, so that you can have them, even though every atom in your body has changed, except the neural DNA. Or we have to hypothesize that they exist in the neural DNA, that memories are actually stored in the DNA. Well, no notion invokes 
evokes such scorn from molecular biologists as this one, and they just rush in to set you straight in a hurry. And the first thing they tell you is, well, (laughs) you've completely misunderstood the notion of information. You see, DNA stores genetic information. It stores codons. It stores these three amino acid sequences. To think that it could go from that to storing experience is uh, just the, a complete misunderstanding of, of what is being suggested. We say, oh, well, then, so what's your explanation for the persistence of memory? Oh, well, we don't actually have one. We're, we're working on that. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think that... Uh, the persistence of memory argues that these, the 90% of the DNA, which is not known to code for any protein or to have any, the so-called silent portions of the genome, which are about 85% of it is silent, somehow information experience is being stored there. I mean, this is the Lamarckian heresy because they said it fed back into the genetic part of the DNA. But there may be in this one molecule both genetic storage and epigenetic storage. Well, then when you look at these drug molecules that we've been talking about, the psychedelics, what you see structurally that they all have in common is they all have very uh, reactive rings benzene rings usually built up on a pentaxial group, a five-sided group in the middle. They're extremely reactive molecules. Okay, um, it was discovered in the 1960s that there's a phenomenon that nobody knows why it happens called intercalation. These drug molecules, if we could blow one up to this big, it would be thin. It would be flat. It's what they call planar. And uh, lo and behold, when you look at the dimensions of this molecule against the dimensions of the bond site that lies between the nucleotides of DNA, you discover that this drug molecule can just slip right in there like toast into a toaster. And they sit down on this very large molecule, the neural DNA, and they begin to broadcast its electron spin resonance at a higher frequency or at a higher amplitude than is happening in normal metabolism. And that this amplifying of the electron spin resonance of DNA is what we experience subjectively as the onset of a psychedelic experience. Well, now you see this this gives cogency to what we're talking about here because it shows that there is a real material mechanism in the core of ourselves which is relating to this molecule and then all this information is flowing out. So we're beginning to create a, a coherent map appealing to the material mind of how these things uh, may work to transduce higher cortical experiences. Obviously, the mind, the mind-brain system, can be thought of as a like an automobile in the sense that there are always fuel efficiency modifications and design modifications that are possible to imagine, which would make the whole system work better. Serotonin is the molecule that is being competed with by these drug molecules. Well, may it not then be that what these drug molecules represent is the same thing that serotonin represents, but in a slightly more efficient packaging that somehow from the point of view of cellular of metabolic dynamics, the, the drug molecule is more efficient. It obviously is. That's why it has a greater affinity for the bond site than the endogenously produced neurotransmitter. Well, it's as though, uh, and I think Aldous Huxley was the first person to suggest this, that the mundane demands of day-to-day life and evolution, the need to be ever on the alert for attack and so forth, 
it has led us to evolve a neurological style of chemical suppression of consciousness that we have narrowed our awareness down into certain narrow channels along which danger may approach. But conceivably, this style of... uh, this flavor of human brain soup could be changed for a different flavor in which we walked around with a much larger awareness and much less immediate focus on being prepared to fall into a fighting stance and fend off an immediate uh, attack on ourselves. I think that what I see as characteristic of... uh, psychedelic people and psychedelic communities is a kind of tendency to go for the big picture. Psychedelic people always are aware that whatever they're talking about is nested in a still larger set of relationships, nested in a still larger set of relationships. That awareness of the big picture could probably be mapped onto what is ordinarily called an awareness of Tao, It's that you don't get down into the little stuff because you know what the I Ching calls the prepotent systems of relationship in which the event is embedded. And that feeds back into the personality, that knowing of that, as permission to relax. You know, you're neither pushing the river nor pulling the river. It goes in its good time and you always seem to be comfortable and there uh, with it. See, this logos, this vegetable mind that I keep referring back to, it may be nothing more than the voice of our own DNA, but whatever it is, when we do not have it guiding us and cultivated within our personality, then it becomes all up to the ego to figure out And the ego is a frightened, pathetic, grasping creature and will make a mess of it, you you may be sure. Eric? Yeah. In these these cultures, in these South American cultures, when are uh, children introduced into the the process? Well, this varies. Among the Aguaruna Hivero, a male child gets his first taste of ayahuasca at three days. Uh, but it's just a taste. The mother just wets her nipple, but it's to to introduce him into the... And I'm sure 